welcome to the Madden America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry, and social justice. Welcome to the Madden America podcast. My name is Leah Harris, and I'm a correspondent with Madden America. I'm so pleased to welcome our guest today to the podcast, Dr. Peter Stastny, a critical psychiatrist, longtime advocate for human rights and mental health, co-author with Darby Penny of The Lives They Left Behind, Suitcases from a State Hospital Attic, and co-editor with Dr. Peter Lehman of Alternatives Beyond Psychiatry. Welcome to the podcast, Peter. Hi, Leah. Thanks for having me on. So I got to see you virtually recently. We both participated in a meeting with Danius Puras, who's the special rapporteur on the right to health and mental health at the United Nations. Um, and I thought it was a really interesting meeting um, with uh, academics and activists uh, for human rights. So maybe you could start us off with your current work in the sphere of human rights and uh, working with the UN. Well, it's interesting you're bringing up uh, the special rapporteur because uh, those of the, your listeners who have followed the reports that he's been producing over the last uh, three, four years uh, must have noticed there's something really pretty radical coming out of the United Nations. And uh, interestingly, we have we have actually provided a lot of uh, input and material. And when I say we, I mean an organization called INTAR, the International Network Towards Alternatives and Recovery, which I co-founded about 15 years ago. And uh, the special rapporteur and his collaborator, Julie Hanna, they've, they've been to INTAR on a number of times, and we've managed to connect them with a lot of amazing activists around the world. So that's been a really interesting connection and an important one, and it's continuing. Hopefully, we'll be able to do more. When his uh, after his mandate ends next year, how can we continue to keep that work going uh, after he departs, not knowing necessarily who the next special rapporteur will be, and if that individual uh, will be open to or share our values in the way that he and his team have? Well, we we got to build a stronger um, worldwide network of people who are in support of the things that Daniels advocates for and the things that many of us have been advocating for, you know, aside from human rights, no coercion and Bible, Bible and, and helpful alternatives beyond and outside of psychiatry. So I think building that movement and, and providing more and more information, of course, Madden in America has done a lot of work in that, in, in that regard. But I think there's, Many people who need to actively uh, come together and work on policy implications and how governments uh, can actually influence the services that are being provided in their countries and not leave it up to psychiatry alone to transform itself. Peter, what do you see as the core values connected to human rights that we can all organize around, even if globally the particular situation and circumstances in our countries with the mental health system may differ? Well, there's two different things. One is when uh, when people first or, or early on enter uh, the mental health system or, or, or seek help, they're usually in some form of a crisis, you know, some type of way that their life is not continuing uh, on the track they would like it to be. There could be a number of different things going on, you know, severe, less severe, suicidal, altered states, experiences that that put people at risk, in fact, to, uh, you know, not only be psychiatrized or institutionalized, but also to run into a lot of problems in, the, in society. So I personally like to focus on these moments of, crisis and, and, and turn them into opportunities rather than what often or many times happens is the beginning of, of a career as a mental patient. So for me, that's a very important focus. Of course, then there are all these uh, many thousands and millions of other people who've already been through the system and who either have made it out uh, reasonably well or are still languishing and either institutionalized or in the community, but living poorly or homeless 
And of course, we need to look out for those people too. Many of them have had long exposures to psychotropic drugs, which have harmed them more than they've helped. And so there's, there's a lot of work that needs to be done in, in, these air, in, uh, in these two areas. What I mean by these two areas, the people are coming into the, being exposed to mental health for the first time, and then people who've already had a, a long history or more or less long history. So, so that, now the, the second group, of course, people now refer to, and many people refer to themselves as individuals with psychosocial disabilities. And that is the language that's being used internationally. So the disability right move, rights movement has been able to start talking about mental health much more in the last uh, 10 years since the United Nations passed the CRPD. The There's a lot of work that needs to be done. And, and we know a lot of stuff already, but we're not, being, we're not able to apply it. I'd love to hear your take on what are the different avenues for organizing among countries that have ratified and countries that haven't ratified the CRPD. Well, you know, you know, ratifying conventions and, and safeguarding people's rights is really only the beginning. I mean, I think that's just a basic human thing. It's a convention, a UN convention, and and if politically people don't sign on or not, that's that's another. Uh, another subject, you know, and I think that there's a lot of really good work. Also, the special rapporteur for persons with disabilities, uh, Catalina de Vandas, has been doing tremendous work uh, to highlight the situations of persons with psychosocial disabilities. But I, I feel my my area is more making sure that that support can be extended to people in a rights conscious or rights preserving way, but it also has to be helpful, effective, and and make sure that people do not get harmed more by the help that they're getting. So yes. when you're talking about internationally how to apply it, like of course uh, the West in some ways is much more difficult to transform. In 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 essence, the the more you are dealing with entrenched, huge, powerful institutions like hospital conglomerates, city hospitals that are, you know, basically relying on inpatient work for most of their revenue, you have a big problem. So in some ways, uh, countries of the global south where psychiatry has not spread and uh, has not been funded to that extent have better opportunities uh, to begin or to implement things that are, from the start, uh, rights-conscious and effective. Peter, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about how you first came to do the work that you do today as a critical psychiatrist and a human rights activist. Uh, I was an advocate against psychiatry before I ever became a psychiatrist. I was a medical student in Austria when I met uh, people from Italy, psychiatrists who were transforming their, their mental health system in spades. You know, they were basically, uh, in late 70s, they were basically saying, we're going to close down all the institutions where we've sent people in Italy for the last 150 years, and we're going to replace them with uh, community-based mental health services. So these people for that for at that time were pretty radical, and they uh, prompted us in Austria to build a little sort of sister organization. They, they, they were called Democratic Psychiatry, and we started to demonstrate against our local institution, which was uh, called the Steinhof, which is pretty infamous and also beautiful. So one of the most spectacular Jugendstil architecture in 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 the world. But that's where I began, you know, protesting against uh, locking people up in institutions. I had no intention of becoming a psychiatrist through, throughout medical school. I was interested in cardiology, and I uh, worked in a coronary care unit, you know, where people come with heart attacks and, uh, you know, life-threatening conditions. And I was a young uh, resident. And I 
started to realize that the people who are suffering are more important in some ways to me at least than the catheters for sticking up into their heart. Now, you know, I started to see that me medicine became a very mechanized and mechanical techno technocratic enterprise. And yes, of course, we could save lives, but no one really paid attention to how the people were doing with that. So I became interested in the perspective of the people who were going through these things. And that's how it's, my interest in mental health started. Then I worked with kids in a kind of psychosomatic unit at the hospital. And one of my first experiences there with actual psychiatry was when we were admitting young people who had attempted suicide in order to save them from going to that hospital, that institution that I mentioned earlier, Dechstein Hall, from where they were sort of detoxified, where they were first treated for, for overdoses. So we had this deal where they could send us young people under 18 to that, in, into this pediatric ward. And I started to see them. And, you know, I would literally, several people could have easily ended up in Steinhof. And we treated them basically with talk therapy and family therapy and had amazing results. You know, for many years, I was in touch with a young woman who thanked me for saving her life for saving her from going into the mental institution. So that kind of was one of the first things that I experienced. Well, then I came to the States and, and I decided to do my psychiatric training here in New York, in the Bronx, at Albert Einstein College of Medicine. And I, I was interested to come there because the guy who ran the residency training program was uh, uh, a man by the name of Joel Covell, who was a Marxist psychoanalyst, and there was a rather left-wing group of faculty at this at Albert Einstein College of Medicine, which attracted me. And so I worked with them for a number of years, and 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 we tried to even at a certain point start a storefront in the South Bronx, run uh, with Marxist psychoanalytic principles, which never actually happened. But you know, so then I went to work in a place called Bronx State Hospital. People think the Bronx is one of the scariest places in the world, but that wasn't so. And in fact, I met a lot of people there uh, who were patients who had uh, gotten stuck there. And I started to just engage with people, work on an open ward. People were homeless. And we became more partners in what we were doing than doctors and patients. So that was a very transformative period of time. So were you alone in that approach at the hospital or were your colleagues seeing that it was actually making a difference? Well, I was uh, um, not exactly alone, but, you know, the approach at that time, I guess one would have called social uh, social psychiatry. but there were a number of people in the faculty that were supportive of that idea, but they weren't radical. They were not, you know, against institutions. They were not against hospitals. No one was talking about human rights then. But it was very clear to me that I didn't want to lock people up so that they can get help. I didn't want to work in places where that's being done. So I started this kind of, uh, I guess we used to call it a sort of a laissez-faire approach. Where, where we didn't do a lot of therapy or a lot of stuff. We were available to people and the doors were open. And, you know, we, we, we also realized, I also realized, and with me and a number of other people, that the power of the peer group was something that has been neglected forever in, in, in psychiatry. I mean, yes, there was talk about therapeutic communities, but those were very regimented and, and staff-led. I was more interested in in supporting people to become uh, engaged with each other and to start stuff for themselves and learn how to progress in that way. So I was very interested in, uh, for example, a, an approach called the Fairweather Lodge, which yeah. was founded in the 60s by a man named George Fairweather, 
who essentially believe that people can manage their lives uh, autonomously as groups if they learn uh, certain strategies and certain methods that uh, uh, would sustain them both economically and uh, health-wise in the community. So we kind of replicated that a little bit. And in doing that, we also started to talk to people about their lives and how they started to feel suddenly in a very different position from being a patient to being a helper. And I remember that is what really transformed my outlook in the late 80s when people started to tell me how they could somehow make a much or more of a difference in their own life when they could see themselves as helpful to others. What are some of the changes that you saw in people as a result of taking this approach of validating their ability to contribute in a way that they choose? Well, at a certain time, I literally thought that it was a, a form of empowerment that countermanded, counteracted everything that was happening in institutions and with medications uh, in people who were supposed to be helped. People who were supposed to be helped in those institutions were taught to be good patients, take their medication, go to therapy, and be quiet and be docile and maybe do some menial work at the at best. But suddenly when we started to see that people could do meaningful things for others, they transformed. And they became I mean, I remember a woman who's been there who was there about twenty years. Her name was Rosita. I remember her. She was kind of helpful to the staff. She would run around and get cigarettes for them and coffee. Uh, they started uh, to deliver food to homeless people in the city. It was an idea that uh, one of the patients came up with. Rosita became transformed. She made sandwiches for people, and she went to deliver them with the rest of the people on the Bowery. So it just it just was so obvious that something not only psychological, but maybe even physiological happened that, you know, uh, I even thought that the medications that were giving people sort of interfered with their ability to take charge of their lives and the ability to help people counteracted that. And it, it literally, you know, within a couple of years, it led us to some huge changes not only locally, but nationally, because we became part of a national movement. I, I suddenly, within a couple of years of being just a regular attending and a, and a sort of a back ward, open back ward, we were part of a national project called Consumer Operated Businesses, and 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 we were we were leaping ahead, you know, and every step of the way we had started with peer specialists. Again, people said, I want to help others. And then we said, well, if you're going to help people, you could do it two ways. You could volunteer or you can get paid for it. People obviously want to get paid. So we created the, the, the position of peer specialist at that hospital. We were the first. And now there, there, I recently wrote a piece with Darby, as you mentioned, also that uh, uh, somehow, you know, 30 years later, looks at a lot of the pitfalls that happened with that. But back then, it was a huge step forward. And it was uh, uh, it was tremendous. And people just suddenly came out of the woodwork and they said, I want to be a peer specialist. I want to be a peer specialist. Uh, people came who had law degrees and said, well, I want to start a business. I want to start an organization. We started an organization with a woman uh, named Mimi Kravitz, may she rest in peace, who was a lawyer. And she says, I want to start an organization that provides technical assistance to people wanting to start their own businesses. And I'm talking about in 1990. And that organization actually existed for 10 years and got a lot of funding. So I think we were, we were, we were pretty far ahead. And then things went a little sour later on. Peter, I'm wondering if you can talk about the Suitcases Project and how you got involved in it. What the Suitcase Project was about 
is unearthing the, the stories, the actual stories of the people that ended up in that place, upstate New York, Willard Psychiatric, uh, where they spent the rest of their lives for the most part and died there, to find out what their lives, what their stories were like um, uh, outside of their medical records, outside of what people wrote about them. So that was the thing that fascinated me. Of course, when you find 400 suitcases in an attic of a mental institution, you are intrigued. Half of them were full of stuff, and you are seeing, oh, my God, you know, it's like lives in suitcases that were lost. You know, of course, I don't want to analogize the hospital with the Holocaust, but I come from that background in my family. And suitcases were very symbolic when people had to leave things behind and then were killed. But in this case, I, I don't want to say they were killed, but they were shunted away from society and not given a chance to return. So the symbolism of the left suitcases was very powerful. And so we tried to make it into a story uh, where we could contrast what we could piece together from the suitcases with what was in the medical records about the people that were there. So, you know, we had exhibits, we took pictures, we had pictures, and we had the book. So it was a really uh, poignant and sad to unearth those stories. Uh, but I, I learned a lot, you know, I learned how people survive in spite of everything, you know. There was a guy whose suitcase we kind of picked accidentally. He turned out to be the uh, uh, grave digger of Willard Psychiatric Center for 50 years. He dug graves for his fellow patients. I mean, that I'm still shivering when I, when I remember this story. We couldn't look in depth into every person whose suitcase we found. So we had, uh, we had to pick. And we picked one suitcase where there were very few things, like a belt, a razor, a pair of shoes, uh, you know, a couple of other personal items, mostly items that were deemed unsafe on the ward. But somehow we were struck by it and we picked it and we didn't know who this man was. And then we discovered that he was the grave digger of Willard. So that was pretty deep. There's so much about the suitcases project that's significant, um, the way that it uh, puts a human face on people who were locked away or are feared, uh, marginalized, demonized even in our society at different points in time. Yeah, I mean, these become closed worlds. I mean, Willard was a, a place where uh, the staff and the patients cohabited the same space, depended on each other. The, the patients often were doing work that, that the staff were not doing, and it became sort of, a, a, you know, like a, an environment of its own, closed out. The rest of the world didn't know much about it at all, and people disappeared. But yet, it was kind of... A, I don't want to say a vibrant, but, you know, most people who, who were there as patients, you know, 60, 50 to 60 percent of the people were working. And when we looked at the people who were really suffering throughout their stay there in, in ways that were obvious and where they couldn't actually fall into that role of the worker patient, they were people who seriously had, had serious traumas in their lives that were never recognized, serious losses. And of course, no one was really receiving any kind of talking therapy. People were misjudged, misheard, miscredited, and became condemned in that way. Uh, one woman I remember, uh, a uh, she was a nun, a young nun, and she uh, uh, was constantly you know, the, 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 the book will tell you the whole story if you manage to get it, but it, it's amazing. She kept saying, I'm looking for dispensation. You know what that is? It's when you're trying to get out of the order, the, uh, the, the convent, when you feel you've sinned 
and you don't deserve to be a nun anymore. There's an official process. And by the time she got to the hospital, everybody kept saying that that was a delusion. The whole thing was a delusion. So her life was completely thrown away. And she languished in a terrible fashion for the rest of her life. So, you know, Mocha, Lawrence Mocha, the, the, the grave digger, I'm sure he wasn't particularly happy being at Willard, but he had a mission, which is to dig graves. And he sustained, he wanted, he kept doing that until he was in his 80s. So, I mean, these are very, very deep stories. Peter, let's switch gears. Uh, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about your work as a filmmaker and how that connects with amplifying the histories and the stories of people who may not otherwise be heard or known. Well, you know, the Willard Project, the Suitcase Project, was the only time I ever did work on dead people. Um, I prefer working with living people. Their stories are not separable from their lives. I feel you're bringing up my film work. I mean, it is true that the first films I've made were all around mental health stuff. And and it was basically um, in order to bring to light uh, people and their active, act, activism and their stories, if you will, but mostly their activism to the public. So the first film I made was uh, um, about activists, four activists, in, some in, two in Europe and two in America. And, uh, you know, then we made a film with kids in a, in a psych ward, in a children's hospital, where they acted and played their own stories, and we turned it into a little experimental film. And so, yes, I wanted to break the walls by bringing out the stories from within that were usually just lost and, and, and sort of ended up in the charts of, of the patients in these institutions. And of course, there was a movement beginning in the, in the 80s that was suddenly very promising. When you say the Italians were radical in the 60s, 70s, well, they were all psychiatrists. When you say the movement in the United States was radical in the 80s, uh, well, they were all ex-mental patients. So I participated in that transition, and then I became allied with people who've been through the system. And this is kind of how I see myself now. For all these years, my most important connections have been to people who've been through the system and who turned their lives around in order to make a difference personally, politically, and so forth. What advice do you have for practitioners who, like yourself, uh, may be at odds with the uh, prevailing values or practices of mental health and psychiatry? You see, I think we're actually in a time when, when people, uh, for example, young psychiatrists, have a lot of trouble with the profession. Many people who go to medical school don't want to be psychiatrists because they feel it's kind of like a dying field because of all the misguided and problematic stuff that happened in history and including recent history with medications. And so there's a lot of people who are, who entered the field and who realize, wow, this is not exactly what I bargained for. I really don't think that I can help people in this way. So I feel there's a, there are opportunities, and we're actually doing a project now called Reimagining Psychiatry, which uh, is too early to talk too much about, but the basic gist of it is to get uh, stories and experiences and narratives of people, psychiatrists and others, but mainly psychiatrists, who have done transformative work in their lives or who are facing these struggles as young psychiatrists. And I think that will become interesting and relevant because there are people who say psychiatry has to just go out of business. And it can either go into, it can be split into social work, psychology, and some form of neurology. Why do we need psychiatry? But so, so that's possible. 
could happen, or uh, psychiatrists or uh, you know can become transformative people in their communities in the world and make things and, and make things different. But you know, psychiatrists are not that important except when they are in power. You know, and when psychiatrists run things, um, it becomes uh, problematic. Of course, the biggest hurdle I would say is that psychiatrists actually have the power to lock people up and to medicate them against their will. I think that's a big problem. I think people should relinquish that power. People should refuse to accept it. People should refuse to put their signature on documents that cause people to be locked up. That would be my hope for the future, for the near future. I was actually the clinical director of Bronx Psychiatric Center, Bronx State Hospital, for a year, acting clinical director. And I said to my boss, the director, I am not going to sign any orders for involved medication over objection. And, you know, I got, as a director, clinical director, I got stacks of these papers, and I didn't sign them. And she said to me, well... That means you got to come up with something else. And then I made that to my, my, my mission. For each and every person whose order I refused to sign, I went and tried to do uh, consultations and met the people and did a whole bunch of things. Of course, it wasn't enough because people were trapped in, in the system, in wards, where there were very few alternatives for them. But still... I, I feel institutions like that should not exist. 90% of the hospitals should be closed. Uh, 10% should be voluntary. <laughs> and uh, and most uh, psychiatrists and others should be working in, co- in communities with other people who are truly out to help people and not to hurt them. So it sounds like you're still optimistic in a way, or at least cautiously optimistic that psychiatry can transform into a liberatory force where it's not about power over people, but more of a dynamic of power together. I don't know that I'm hopeful. I I know it's possible, but I'm not sure that it's likely. You know, we're again at a time here in this country, in the United States, where people are screaming for psychiatry to solve problems of gun violence, homelessness, all that stuff, which obviously are huge, complex societal problems. And when psychiatry gets called to do that, then they come up with solutions that are not only false, but harmful. You know, locking more people up, forcing people to take intramuscular injections of medications. And so I would say that psychiatrists uh, can, again, take a stand and should. And say, no, 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 this could be a whole different thing. But for that, they would need a different type of, I don't want to use the word ammunition, but I think, they, or argument. They would need to arm themselves with the conviction that people can be helped without the use of force. And, and that's kind of what I, what I am busy trying to do still, is trying to provide people with the knowledge and the information that we already have, that people, the vast majority of people, can be helped without the use of force. And that that to make decisions for the entire system based on maybe some exceptional situations where somebody might have to involve a legal system, that's what's been wrong with psychiatry for 200 years. And psychiatrists have noticed that, some psychiatrists have noticed that early on when they talked against restraint, talked against locking people up against their will. They talked about that from the beginning, but I, I hope it's going to get stronger. I think we can achieve something. The movement against coercion is, is gaining strength, I feel, internationally. But it has, to be, it has to be armed. It has to be supplied with information and practical know-how to show how people can get help without force and in preserving human rights. And I think we can do that in conjunction with the thousands and thousands of survivors who've come out as advocates or peer supporters, as well as other professionals. 
So, Peter, sadly, we are coming to the end of our time. Um, I'm wondering, are there any other projects or initiatives that you're involved in uh, that you'd like to let the listeners know about? Well, um, I'm thinking of putting together a conference. Uh, I think there's a group of us working to have a conference in New York on rights-based crisis supports. I think it's a little too early to announce it. We're, We're getting there. Uh, we've learned a lot in the last 10 years about that in New York and elsewhere in this country. Crisis respites have come out and, uh, and have turned into viable alternatives that the, the system is looking favorably at, which is both interesting and a little troublesome. But I, I think that peer run respites, uh, open dialogue is being talked about. Soteria should be reintroduced as a, a very important alternative for people who are going through extreme, uh, you know, uh, emotional transformations and changes. So I'm 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 working on a lot of stuff. There's some wonderful people around, and and it always heartens me. Like at the meeting you mentioned at the beginning of our conversation, there were so many people who are activists and who are doing important stuff in the city and in this country. I think uh, that's where the hope lies. And we have to bring more people that are kind of stuck in the mainstream and not really knowing what to do uh, at this point. We have to bring them into the movement more, and that's a big mission. And I'm not sure how that's going to get accomplished, but that should be a goal to teach and enlighten people that are that are kind of struggling in the fields of psychology, social work, and psychiatry to figure out how can we do things better. You know, how can we do things and that actually people want to experience? I mean, we shouldn't really talk about alternatives. We, we, we know a lot about what helps people. So that knowledge should be the mainstream. And, and in sense, if you're talking about alternatives, it's almost like you want to, want to stand it on its head and say, well, what about the very few people who actually don't benefit? We're going to need from, from, from the so-called alternatives, from the, the knowledge that we've gathered it around the world. What about the people that don't seem to benefit from that? What else do we got to do? And I'm sure that's going to be something that will have to deal with trauma. You know, I think there's a lot of trauma in the world and in families and in society and in wars. And that impacts people tremendously. And I think we really have to work harder on figuring out how to support people. And the trauma lens will will help a lot, but we need more. I'm not getting bored and I'm not getting tired. We're in a, it's an exciting time and we'll keep fighting. Dr. Peter Stastny, it has been so great speaking with you today. And thank you so much for being on the podcast. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Madden America podcast. Visit maddenamerica.com for more news, views, and updates.